Hello, Booktube. I've got a poem for you today, and as promised, it's a poem by a poet who is not completely forgotten. <laughs> the theme that has merged lately on our daily poetry rounds, thanks to this anthology. This is the new poetry, uh, which ironically enough came out almost 100 years ago uh, in the 1930s. Uh, this is an anthology that I found at a little free library. Someone put a 1964, 1963 dust jacket on it. Uh, and it is full of really good poetry. It's a really good anthology, but as you've noticed if you've been watching these poetry videos, uh, quite a few poets in here are completely forgotten. They're just, there's no, no hint or murmur of them. They don't get anthologized anymore. They don't get read. Their works don't get collected. There are no biographies of them. Uh, and I'm perfectly happy to keep reading those people. In fact, it's kind of a neat tribute. But I thought for today we would read a poet uh, who is well-known, whose name has survived. And uh, there are quite a few in this volume, and the one I chose for today, almost inevitably, is Wilfred Owen, uh, who was really good-looking. Wilfred Owen was a young man who was really good-looking. He would certainly have been the very cat's pajamas for the literary circles of the 20th century. That would certainly have happened. He would have lived long enough to be a very white, very wrinkled, very tiresome BBC presenter. But uh, he went the extra mile for literary pretentiosauruses uh, and got himself killed at the end of World War I, right at the end, like days before the armistice. Uh, and that immediately lent his works that had the poetry that he'd written up until then uh, a hallowed edge that you just can't get rid of. You can't beat it. You just can't beat it. The, old, the, the crusty old queenish cynic who said that death is a very good career move was not talking about Wilfred Owen, but certainly could have been talking about Wilfred Owen. All the elements are in place. He wrote about the fatal attraction of war. He died in war, and he was very good looking. <laughs> so it's inevitable that he's in this volume, and it's inevitable sooner or later that we will uh, read a poem of his. I would certainly rather read a poem of his, and there are no danger of his poems ever going out of print. He will always be anthologized. He will always be studied. And I have no objection to reading his poems. I have a lot more objection to reading biographies of him, as I have read ten, probably, maybe more. Uh, <laughs> that, that gets a little tiresome. There isn't much to write in a biography of Wilfred Owen. Uh, people still manage to do it. I wrote, uh, I lost my temper in one review of one such biographies probably ten years ago, fifteen years ago. If I remember, I'll try and find it and link it down below. Uh, but otherwise, I try to take them seriously. Uh, the poetry is easier to take seriously. So we're going to read a poem today called Arms and the Boy. And in the 1930s or in the 1920s or whenever Wilfred Owen wrote this, it would have been far easier. Uh, I guess he didn't write this in the 30s. and He didn't write it in the 20s. He would have written it in the teens, probably, and it probably close to being in his teens as well. But even so, the currency in the title would have been known to all of his readers and is largely unknown to the 21st century. And that is that Arms and the Boy is an, an ironic evocation of the first line of Virgil's Aeneid, which is Arms and the Man. Uh, just, just to let you know, because the, the poem doesn't explain that. Any, anyone who's reading the poem, it's sort of their duty to explain that, because otherwise a modern audience won't know. Uh, but this is the poem, Arms and the Boy. Let the boy try along this bayonet blade how cold steel is and keen with hunger of blood. Blue with all malice, like a madman's flash, and thinly drawn with famishing of flesh. Lend him to stroke these blind, blunt bullet heads, which long to muzzle in the hearts of lads. Or give him cartridges of fine zinc teeth, sharp with the sharpness of grief and death. For his teeth seem for laughing round an apple, and there lurk no claws behind his fingers supple. And God will grow no talons at his heels, nor antlers through the thickness of his curls. Uh, and you can see the, the, the mordant irony of the poem, the narrator of the poem is saying, better acquaint a little boy with these instruments of war and death, because otherwise he won't naturally know of them. His creator, his natural development, will not grow talons on his body, it will not uh, create fangs in his face, it will not make a monster out of him, it takes the instruments of war to do that. Uh, so the, the conceit of the poem is that, you, ironically, you might, you must 
acclimate this, this little boy to these things yourself. Otherwise, he'll never know them. Uh, and the, the poem itself is rather good. There are flashes in here of uh, genuine poetic talent. I am in the very great minority here. I am a heretic in the church of Wilfred Owen in saying that flashes of brilliance are about all we ever get from him. He was by, by no means a finished poet. He wasn't old enough. He hadn't done it enough. <laughs> but good luck saying that now about him or any other World War I poets. Uh, but nevertheless, that line, for his teeth seem for laughing round an apple, that evokes an image instantly and is very good. Uh, also, the same thing with uh, blue with all malice, like a madman's flash. That's very good. Uh, you might have noticed, if you were paying attention to, uh, to the end words there, that there is a, a very faint, intentionally off-kilter end rhyme scheme going on here. We have blade and blood, flash and flesh, heads and lads, teeth and death, apple and supple, heels and curls. Young as he was, Wilfred Owen knew how to do better than that. He's intentionally not doing that. He's intentionally not giving you neat storybook rhymes here, uh, probably as a commentary on... Uh, the tragic inhumanity of war. <laughs> Did he ever comment on anything else? I don't think so. Uh, so there you go. We got a, a famous poet for us to get us past the middle of the week. And maybe we'll, maybe I'll find another famous poet in this. I'm not leaving this volume anytime soon. Maybe I'll find another famous poet in this volume uh, for tomorrow. And we'll talk about it then. <laughs> so anyway, I'll wrap this up for now. That's your poem for today. Uh, Doomed Youths and War. <laughs> but I'll be back. Thank you, Booktube.